Call for short. Uh, I find this is a bit easier, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I must admit I am quite surprised to see so many of you at a uh, secret strategy meeting. <laughs> so much the better. Oh, this is my educator, Captain Stokes of the First New Hampshire. Uh, you are probably by now wondering who this French soldier is who professes to address you in such a manner. And I wish first and foremost uh, to correct you in this notion because I am not a French soldier. No. It is true that I am French, as is rather evidenced by the accent. Yes. It is true that I am a soldier, as is evidenced by the uniform. But I wear the uniform of the Continental Army of the United States, which makes me an American soldier, one who, through no fault of his own, happens to have been born and raised in France. <laughs> uh, you are also probably wondering how it came to be that I am here in America fighting for the independence of a nation to whom I owe no allegiance by birth. Uh, and I will, I will tell you this if you will spare me the few moments and then I shall uh, open the floor to whatever questions you may have. Ask you, who is that that call? Yeah. Say we. 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 <laughs> now you know twice as much, friends. <laughs> To answer the question of how I came to be here, I must go back to the summer of 1775. And in the summer of 1775, I was stationed with my unit in the French cavalry in the city of Metz in eastern France. How many of you have perhaps been to France? By a show of hands. Ah, très bien, très bien. How many of you have been to Metz? Excellent, monsieur. And then you know, monsieur, uh, vous savez très bien que Metz se situe sur la frontière avec la Prussie, n'est-ce pas? Oui, oui. oui. <laughs> Uh, as the gentleman and I were just discussing, the city of Metz is situated on the Prussian border. And it was along this border that a war was fought. It was fought on this continent as well. In uh, Europe, we call it the Seven Years' War. Okay, in America, it was called the French and Indian War, as though the French and the Indians were the only parties involved. No, 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 no. I assure you, this is not the case, my friends. My own father, you see, my father lost his life in this war. He was not killed by the French, and he was certainly not killed by the Indians. He was killed by the English at the Battle of Minden, which took place in Prussia in 1759. <coughs> this war remained very fresh in the memories of the officers who had served during the conflict. Among them, the Maréchal de Bruggy, my commanding officer in Metz, who was an enormous gentleman who kept his troops in very rigorous exercises, day in and day out, for he imagined that the war would any day re-erupt along the old lines. The summers in the east of France, they are, they are very warm, they are very humid, they are very stale. This is perhaps difficult for some of you to imagine, yes? <laughs> uh, they are very calm, yes, but it is a sort of calm that suggests a, a certain holding of the breath. A lurking danger, just behind the tree line, beyond that. To an older gentleman, such as the Maréchal de Broglie, this must have suggested a, a lurking danger, a powder keg, ready to explode. To a younger gentleman, such as myself, I was about 17 years old. I was very far from my home in Paris, from my family in Auvergne. It was excruciatingly boring. <laughs> Highest ranking officers to dine with the Duke, as well as all of those officers who carry titles of nobility, uh, a category into which I am qualified by virtue of being a marquis. Can someone tell me perhaps what is a marquis? Do you not know? I know that you have none in this country. That is an excellent thing for your sakes. Uh, well, then I shall ask you do you know what is a, a, a king? Everyone knows, yes, what a king is. Do you know what is a prince? Yes. Do you know what is a duke? Yes. Do you know what is a count? Do you know a marquis is between a count and a duke? Oh. The marquis of Lafayette, we have borne this title since the days of Joan of Arc and the war against England. I am descended from a long line of soldiers to carry the title of Marquis Lafayette, not that he has protected us in battle very much. But as I am a marquis, though I was but a lonely captain of dragoons, I was invited to this, uh, this dinner with the Duke of Gloucester where I was given three very particular tasks to perform. First and foremost, I was to arrive on time, it's important. <laughs> Second, I uh, was not to speak unless spoken to. And third, I was to pour liberal amounts of champagne for the Duke and all of his entourage. But the Duke, he was very talkative at him. Very likable, very affable, most unlike his brother the King. 
and he shared with us that evening news of events that were unfolding here in the New World, where it seems a group of uh, Bostonians, uh, for their activities seemed to be concentrated in and around the city of Boston, a group of Bostonians had become most displeased with their lack of representation in the English Parliament, uh, and had in fact grown ever more vocal in their displeasure with every punitive measure passed against them. This is a region of your country I have come to learn that enjoys being vocal in its displeasure. <laughs> Apologies to the state of Europe. <laughs> For his part, the Duke of Gloucester was not unsympathetic to the American cause, quite the contrary, but it was not his decision to make. And events, you see, had already taken a turn for the violent. Because a group of these Bostonians, these uh, insurgents, he called them, had taken up arms against the king's own soldiers in two towns outside of Boston. Concord? Hey, oui, Lexington, merci, you oui. <laughs> Concord and Lexington. News of this, you must remember, news of this had only just arrived in the capitals of Europe. As well as news that the Congress of Colonial Americans meeting in Philadelphia had selected a man to lead a continental American army. A man who lives in that house. A man who was never known to me, l'assassin Jumonville lui-même, George Washington. Well, mes amis, I know that I have told you that my task at this dinner was to remain silent and I've spoken to, but at the talk of this revolution, these fiery speakers, Patrick Henry, uh, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, I could think of nothing else. And I asked the Duke every question I could think of. Who are these troops? <coughs> From where do these farmers and merchants draw the courage with which they stand up to the king's own soldiers? Shall they continue to fight until they have formed a new and independent nation? And what then, huh? Shall they not be trading the yoke of one tyrant for that of another? But you cannot continue in this manner, my friends. It must have been for hours. But my mind had already been made up. For the first time, I heard America's name pronounced the you that I love. And when I learned that she was fighting for her freedom, I wished to shed my blood for her as well. And the days that I have spent fighting alongside my fellow American soldiers, I shall count among the happiest days of my entire life. I immediately began to make preparations to leave France, especially if all of the exciting battles were being fought on this side of the <laughs> uh, But of course, that is only the beginning of the story. I, I wish now to uh, entertain whatever questions you may have. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to see you today. Vous avez des questions? Vous voulez peut-être que je continue? Oui. Je continue. Alors, très bien. When I arrived in Philadelphia, uh, well, I should first say that when I arrived in America, uh, I arrived in the city of Charleston in South Carolina. And uh, this being my first trip to America, I did not quite realize the distance between Charleston and the capital in Philadelphia. <laughs> and so I wished to make a grand entrance with my, uh, with my companions, and, and we walked through six carriages on the road between Charleston and Philadelphia. When finally we arrived in Philadelphia, I was given a rather cool reception from Congress. Hmm? Who is this, this foreigner seeking fame and fortune who does not wish to, uh, to, uh, to follow the, uh, the American orders? I, I spoke very poor English at this time, and so when I was finally granted a reception in front of Congress, I, I prepared my notes very carefully. And I said that after everything I had been through, I had earned the right to two favors. The first, is to serve your cause. And the second is to do so as a volunteer. And this caught the attention of Congress rather quickly. But no, no, no. It was not, a, it was not simply a matter of believing I would get no expense to them. No, no, no. It was a, that is a rather American, if you probably the expression, an American misunderstanding of the French language. They heard the word volunteer and assumed that I was asking for a, an honorary commission and a decorative right. No, 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 no. Mes amis, this is not the meaning of the word in French. In the world, in French, the word volontaire. The word volontaire, it has a meaning most specific. And it refers to a young officer who is being groomed for command by a general or a field marshal or someone of superior rank while he performs the duties of an aide du camp. But a volunteer aide du camp who is a major general with no troops to lead into the battle and who serves without pay, this was unheard of. Nobody knew what to do with me. And I began to wonder why it was I had traveled all this way to America in the first place, until something happened. And that happened that summer of 1777 when I was invited to dine by the Continental Congress in Philadelphia at the City Tavern 
where the dinner was hosted by the Congress and His Excellency General Washington was to be the guest of honor. I remember it as though it were yesterday. The, the windows were all open to relieve the room of the oppressive Philadelphia heat in the long room on the, the second floor of the city tower. Uh, the, the windows were left open, yes, but the air remained smoky because of all of the lamps and all of the tapers and the candles that had been lit over the course of the evening. I sat at one end of a very long table and His Excellency General Washington sat at the other and everyone was distracted by his presence. It, it seemed to bespeak of history, the, the majesty of his character, his dignity, it, it drew the very air from the chamber. There I was but a thin youth in a fancy new uniform, 19 years old, he must have considered me some sort of young puppy dog, lost, lost from his home. But uh, after the dinner was concluded, he came to me and spoke to me very kindly. He, he complimented me on the service that I had made and the sacrifices that I had offered in support of the American cause. And he told me it would please him if I called the quarters of the commander-in-chief my home and considered myself a part of his family. His family, mes amis, this world, it struck out at me like a sort of boat. Family. Because once again, there is a very similar word in French, the word famille. But the word famille, it refers only to relatives of the blood, you see. I learned shortly that His Excellency was referring to his military family and the officers under his direct command and his aides de camp who traveled him from headquarters to headquarters. But for a moment, I believe it was His Excellency's intention to adopt me as his son. <laughs> for I knew that he had none of his own, and, uh, and for I had never known my own father, but uh, that is of course a, a different matter. Uh, in time, I have indeed come to think of His Excellency as as much of a father as I have ever known. And he, I feel, thinks of me as as much of a son as he shall have It has been my greatest honor and privilege to serve alongside him uh, these, these trying years of independence. Well, this is perhaps another uh, convenient moment to, uh, to pause and, and, and entertain any questions you may have. Madam? Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about your friendship with Mr. Alexander Hamilton. Ah, oui, Monsieur yes. Hamilton. <laughs> Everywhere I go, people ask me about Washington. Usually, people ask me about Washington. But even in Washington's front yard, they ask me about Hamilton. Mon cher Alexandre. Well, you know, Madame, that uh, at the uh, winter encampment at Valley Forge, uh, I was recovering from a wound that I received at the Battle of Brandywine. Uh, I had uh, performed my, coalescent, my, uh, my convalescence in uh, the town of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and so I did not march into Valley Forge with the army, but I rejoined them as soon as I could. The, uh, I was still a major general, but I was still very much an aide de camp in His Excellency's service. And the aide de camp at Valley Forge, it was myself, it was Monsieur Jean Lawrence, Monsieur Alexander Hamilton, it was Captain James Monroe, it was uh, Captain Tesh Tillman. Uh, the five of us were a bit inseparable, madame, you may say. <laughs> Monsieur Hamilton speaks excellent French, and he, uh, he helped me a great deal learn English, which proved to be very important as we began to drill the soldiers in a, in a consistent way in English with the, the help of, of General von Steuben. General von Steuben, of course, speaks German and French and does not very well speak English, but Monsieur Hamilton would translate the orders from German, or would translate the orders from French. Von Steuben would give the orders in his broken French, which Monsieur Hamilton would translate into English, and that is how the troops learned to, to do the drills. And so, uh, Monsieur Hamilton, he is uh, an immensely talented man, an immensely uh, 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 strategic and brilliant man. I regret that I was not in America yet to fight alongside him at the Battle of Princeton, but I understood that he uh, acquitted himself most bravely. Uh, and he is... Uh, Indeed, a friend I am lucky to have made during the war. I am also, madame, perhaps the only thing that Monsieur Hamilton agrees with Monsieur Jefferson about, as they are both very close friends of mine. <laughs> Monsieur. Could you describe your duties with the uh, Continental Army? My duties with the Continental Army? Well, Monsieur, uh, I, I do not want to bore all of you with the details. Suffice it to say, when I was granted my commission as a Major General, my duties were none. My duty was to stay alive because uh, the Congress thought that I would be a conduit through which they could acquire influence at the court of King Louis and Versailles and uh, bring France into the war on the side of the Americans. Truth be told, Monsieur, 
I was absent without leave from the French cavalry, and I had no influence. No influence in the uh, And so, uh, whatever influence they uh, they believed I possessed, they were greatly mistaken. Uh, he was very early in the war, but nearly cost his career. I knew that he wanted to strike a uh, strike a blow in New York, but uh, General Rochambeau did not like this idea, for he felt that the city was too well defended by the English, it would be too hard to, uh, to take up right. My job, primarily, was to keep General Cornwallis from reinforcing the garrisons in New York, and so uh, I did not want to risk an open engagement with him, as I was significantly outnumbered and outgunned, but with each successive maneuver, our troops grew more confident. And finally, General Cornwallis did something that I had been hoping for weeks that he would do, which is he dug in. He needed to secure a deep water port to make his evacuation to New York, and the port he selected was on the Virginia Peninsula in Yorktown. However, his exit was blocked, first by the weather, and then by the French fleet under Amiral Dugras. And when I told His Excellency that General Cornwallis was now trapped in Yorktown, uh, the, the correspondence from him took a much more uh, decisive turn, and the, deci the deciding stroke of the war for independence would indeed be fought with uh, the French and the Americans fighting alongside one another, but it would not be fought in, uh, in New York, it would be fought in Yorktown. And uh, the officers and men of the French Expeditionary Force and His Excellency's, uh, His Excellency's divisions made excellent time in rejoining and uniting our forces in Virginia. Uh, the French fleet under Amiral de Grasse carried very heavy artillery, and it was this artillery that allowed us to uh, bombard the the English entrenchments in Yorktown with impunity, for their artillery was too weak to return fire. Uh, finally, as after the bombardment, we, uh, we knew that the siege uh, would be lifted soon. We knew that victory was in our grasp, and it was Alexander Hamilton, madame, who suggested a, uh, a daring raid into the two uh, leftmost redoubts, and a redoubt is a it is a, a, a bit of a, a man-made hill with spikes sticking out of it that uh, all soldiers are trained to, uh, to construct upon detachment. There are two redoubts nearest to the York River, uh, and uh, Alexander Hamilton proposed a very daring raid, where in the middle of the night, with bayonets fixed and, uh, and no, no powder or ammunition in their weapons, under cover of darkness and with as much silence as they could manage, to storm the redoubts, and surprise the enemy, and it would be led by Captain Hamilton and as well by uh, by, uh, by a similar sized detachment of French troops. Uh, Monsieur Hamilton executed the maneuver perfectly. They stormed the redoubt, and within ten minutes it was out. However, the, the French unfortunately wished to uh, perform with a bit more pomp and circumstance. <laughs> and by, by the time they actually made their attack, Monsieur Hamilton's attack had succeeded, but it had alerted the other redoubts to the presence of our army, and so there were grave casualties on the Side. However, that attack as well was ultimately successful. And when these two redoubts fell, General Cornwallis knew that he had been had and, uh, and sent out his parallel for surrender. Well, Captain Marquis, Colonel Stoblins, we have to leave for a flag ceremony. Uh, perfect. Yes. Mes amis, I, I regret to have to leave you quite so soon, but it is my honor to have met you. I, I shall uh, remain and inspect the troops. We are about to do a ceremony where I will present uh, the 1st New Jersey Regiment with our new Merci, merci beaucoup.